Today I wanted to pick up my reading in Exodus chapter 2. And it says, And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took him for she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh, to, Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days, when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren, and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian, and he and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killedest, killedst the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh, and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them, and watered their flock. And when they came to Reuel, uh, and when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that you are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him, that, we, that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter. And she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. So. I know it's been a little while since I did um, since I did a little video blog um, for my uh, Bible reading, but I think the last one was back dealing with Jacob. So not a whole lot has changed, you know, since that time. You know, Jacob um, he married Leah and Rachel. He had twelve kids. Um, his 11th child, Joseph, was sold into slavery, um, and basically the rest, the very end of Genesis deals with Joseph going into slavery, and then Joseph being appointed to um, rule in Egypt, and then the famine, and his family and his brothers coming down for corn, and then them reconciling, and uh, Jose Joseph and Jacob uh, reuniting and then Jacob basically deciding to bless all of his children um, before he died and passed on. And so that's how Exodus ended and then 
uh, or Genesis ended, and then Exodus starts up with um, sort of catching us up on what happened to the Jews uh, between the point of J Jacob and Joseph's death and um, the birth of Moses. So Moses is interesting because he kind of ushers in this era of the law. Um, not so much with his birth, but later on when he receives the Ten Commandments, um, it starts this new era um, where the law is, is manifest in physical form, um, which up until this point it hadn't been the case. The law was written in men's hearts, which was a testament of the fact that men had the knowledge of good and evil dating back to when Adam and Eve chose to eat the, tr the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was written in their hearts. They knew what sin was and um, they had the knowledge of that and understanding of that within them, within their minds and hearts, but they didn't have it written or codified in a tablet. Um, and so it was based off their conscience. But when Moses comes around, it sort of brings in this new time. It's also a time where God, you know, liberates his people from the bondage of slavery to Egypt. So, um, in the meantime, you know, the children of Israel, are, they multiply, and then the Pharaoh of that age decided his strategy was going to be to kill all their children, all their, men, all their male children. And, of course, um, out of that we see that Moses is born, and he's cast into the river because of that law or that practice that was going around, the infanticide of the male children, the murdering of male children. Um, and there's a lot that we could say about that. I actually had made um, another video talking a little bit about um, Pharaoh and his choice um, back in chapter 1. Uh, his choice to set himself on a path of sin and how um, we all make choices, even though sometimes they seem small, that have a lasting impact and can result in uh, a lot of destruction later on, not just for ourselves but for other people and why it's important to be diligent constantly to be making sure to walk in the Spirit. But as I read Exodus 2, there's a lot here as well. Um, I did want to focus on something very uh, specific though, and it's actually going to be kind of short, hopefully. I say that, I think I say that every time and it's not. But um, I wanted to focus, well before I talk about that, I, I, there was one other, one other thing I noticed, and it's that um, Moses is, he's at the well when he meets the seven daughters of um, Ruel, the priest of Midian. Now, I think this guy, Ruel, is also uh, Jethro. It's the same person because Zipporah is the daughter of Jethro, who later on is a very important figure. Um, Jethro, or Ruel, this priest of Midian, he's not just some priest of a false god. He has a relationship with God and later on he has some very good counsel to give a or Moses um, about how to rule the tribes um, and he's a, a, a good spiritual figure um, but there's not a lot of information about him so it's just to keep it's good to keep in mind that he's not a bad guy. Um, he's a wise person here and he's got these seven daughters who Moses meets at a well. Now that for me rang a bell because uh, it seems like men meeting their wives at, a, at wells or uh, just meeting people at wells is a fairly common thing in the Bible. I mean that's where Isaac, well Isaac didn't meet Rebecca there but Abraham's servant met Re Rebecca there at a well when she was watering their um, their animals and then the Abraham's servant brought him back to, or brought Rebecca back to Isaac and then Jacob met the servants of Laban at a well when he fled out of Canaan from Esau who wanted to kill him he was at a well and the servants of Laban came with their flocks and he rolled the stone from off the well and watered them and then they told Laban hey we found this guy and um, it, Rachel and uh, Leah, or I think it was Rachel, was with the flocks. And he saw Rachel at the well and fell in love with her there. Um, 
And then of course we see Moses here, he's at a well, and there are some shepherds who are trying to scare off the daughters of Jethro or Ruel, and he you know, defends them and waters them, and they go back to their father. And of course he winds up marrying one of them. It's just interesting. Um, I guess part of it was back then, um, maybe that was a place where lots of people congregated. You, th you think about how spread out everything must have been with everybody going about their business, you know, traveling, taking care of their herds, um, farming. It would have been a place where um, strangers met and they would have had to interact with each other at wells because they all needed to share the water. Um, so that's one thing, but I do think there's something else in that about um, what the well represents. And you even think about Jesus and the woman at the well. He sits down and has a conversation with the woman at a well. Um, it's just there are a lot of pictures. Um, and so that's one thing I noticed, but I, I don't want to spend the time looking at that because that may be a little bit too in depth and I need to do a little bit more study in that. There is one thing though that I specifically noticed and it's actually pretty sim pretty sort pretty short pretty simple. In verse um, 17 through 20 and the shepherds came and, dro and drove them away speaking of the daughters of Jethro but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock and when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that you are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. And when I read this, it kind of struck me. It was like, I, in this modern age, um, I don't think we often give that much thought to hospitality um, because we just are around people all the time, you know, driving, you know, from place to place, going to the supermarket, we're just surrounded by people. And we don't give that much thought to being hospitable to the people that we encounter. But Jethro is kind of like he's rebuking his daughters because they were basically saved by this stranger um, who took the time not only to defend them from the shepherds but to water all of their animals and who knows how long that took and it was it did a great service to them and they just left him there and Jethro's like why why did you leave him there bring him home so that we can give him a feast and celebrate with him because we've met this person who went out of their way to do something good for us I want to have, I want to meet this person and welcome him into my home. I want to show him hospitality. And that's such a, that concept, I think we get, it gets skipped over a lot when we talk about the Bible, but it actually is in the Bible. Um, it, for us, specifically in doctrine, it actually does talk about hospitality um, in several places. And then the overall concept of what hospitality is, um, is actually reflected throughout the whole Bible. Um, but the word hospitality itself is mentioned in 1 Timothy um, 3, 2. The bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given the hospitality, apt to teach. And then over in Titus chapter 1, verse um, 8, 7 and 8. For a bishop must be blameless, as the steward of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. So, we see both places that it's mentioned as something that a bishop has to be. Now, a bishop is a pastor, and ultimately we're not all going to be pastors. We're not all going to be filling the office of a bishop, but it is something that we should desire to follow the example of. The way that a bishop is supposed to behave is supposed to set an example for all of us to follow. I mean, that's really one of their main functions, is to be an example. Um, and so, in hospitality as well. Now, you think about hospitality, and obviously back in, um, 
obviously back in um, the 1600s when uh, the KJV was translated, um, hospitality may have meant something a little bit different than what it means today. Now, um, without going into doing an in-depth word study, let's just think about where some words that are similar to hospitality. So um, you've got like the word hospital. What do they do at a hospital? Well, they take care of you, they look after your needs, and uh, they serve you. You think about hospice, right? Hospice, somebody that is no longer able to take care of themselves, they're being looked after and cared for. Um, or just hospitality, like when you go to a, um, when you go to a hotel or an inn, right? You've got the servants, the employees who come and clean and provide you food and refreshments and get you new bath towels. That's hospitality, right? Um, so what is hospitality? Well, hospitality is serving. It's serving someone. It's, um, a lot of people would think, oh, hospitality is when somebody comes into my home, I give them everything that they need. I make the home feel like a welcome place to them. And it is that in the context of the home, but it's also a lot more than that. It's um, going out of our way to serve someone, to help look after their needs, to care for them, um, and to help shelter them. Um, and that's, how, that's really the essence of hospitality. It gets down to the mindset of being a servant. And Philippians 2 talks about how we're all supposed to have that mindset, to serve one another. Um, and that's really the, the key thing I wanted to, that I was thinking about here as I read through Exodus, was that, um, you know, Jethro's daughters are just going about their merry way, and maybe they're just so calloused from having to deal with people like the, sh the shepherds, just rough people that are mean, when they finally stumbled across Moses, this guy that is clearly going out of his way, and he must have been exhausted traveling through the desert to flee from Pharaoh, and he goes out of his way to care for these um, strangers and their flocks, um, that they just kind of ignore that and go home and leave him there. You know, that is... It, it's easy to condemn them for doing that, but heck, I mean, we do the same thing constantly. I mean, we live in a world full of people, and how many people do we go out of our way to show care for or to look after them? Most of the time, people are too busy cutting each other off on the road or pushing past each other in the grocery store, and if somebody does need help, like, man, I can't... I was reading an, an article, and you hear this constantly. Um, an in instance where somebody like falls into the street or where an older person falls down on a busy sidewalk or where somebody's having a heart attack or something or when somebody's getting mugged and everybody just walks past because they're not in the mindset of being a servant. They're not in the mindset of caring or looking after or being hospitable for a person. That's really why hospitality is mentioned as something that a bishop is supposed to do because the bishop is kind of like a hero, a leader. He's a leader of the people. He's a unique individual who goes above and beyond the call of duty. And when everybody else, the every average Joe Blow is just walking past, caught up in their own business and not paying attention to what somebody needs in that moment, or they're just too scared, or they just don't care, they're too callous from dealing with mean people all day, that they don't have the empathy or mercy to show that person in that moment, um, it's understandable that Jethro's daughters would do that to Moses. But Jethro was kind of like a bishop. He was a priest. And he's like, I'm trying to teach you, my daughters, you need to show hospitality to people, especially people like that who do good to you. Um, it, notice how in Titus it said, a lover of good men, it, um, at, or given to hospitality. You know, it's, it's very similar to what Jethro was doing. He saw that Moses was a good man and he wanted to show him hospitality. And ultimately it resulted in Moses being brought into Jethro's house for many years and living with Jethro and marrying one of his daughters and having, a grand, having Jethro's grandson. 
And then later on, the Midianites would be part and incorporated into the tribe of Israel as, or the tribes of Israel as they went back into Canaan. And Midian would dwell in and amongst the Israelites for many years. And um, you saw this even in Judges, um, that story of, uh, I can't remember what the guy's name was, but it was about um, Deborah and Barak, right? There's this great battle, and the guy, this wicked king, um, I can't remember who he was a king of, but he flees into one of the tents of the Midianites, and he's like, hide me, hide me. And she's like, okay, here's some milk, and here's some water to keep you comfortable. I'll hide you from the Hebrews so that they don't kill you. And then she takes a stake and pounds it through his head while he's asleep. And, she, I mean, that's brutal, but she was of the tribe of Midian. And the Midianites, the whole throughout the Old Testament, you see that they were sort of cared for by the Jews. Um, and it's interesting because you see the exchange of hospitality. That Moses showed kindness to Jethro's daughters. Then Jethro showed kindness to Moses. And again, the Midianites showed kindness to Israel when they fled out of Egypt. And then the Israelites showed kindness to the Midianites. But of course, they're was a downside to that as well because the Midianites were not circumcised. Um, but, you know, th that goes into a deeper study about um, the relationship of, that Israel had with um, the Gentiles. And here, even later on, Moses' relationship with Zipporah um, doesn't turn out well. Um, in fact, you know, M Moses' time in the world uh, had him behaving like a Gentile like part of the world and not the way God would have him behave and it had an impact on him and on his son and you don't see much written about Gershom his son um, but God has preserved this um, example from Jethro at the very least even if there were not so good things about Midian later on you have a lot of stuff preserved about Jethro and Jethro's positive influence not only on Moses but on all of Israel when they came out and I think that's powerful. And I think Jethro here is being an excellent reminder for us about how important it is to think about other people's needs and to help think and to help provide for them and serve them. Even if we're not all bishops, right? We're not all the priests of Midian like Jethro was. We could at least follow the example God's given us in his word and hopefully the example he's given us in this life with other people, other leaders, bishops ideally, but sometimes it's other people, maybe older people. Um, it could be a simple, you know, there's this old concept of um, people like specifically men um, doing things like holding the door, you know, letting other people go first, doing things. That's whatever the world wants to call it they call it chivalry that's not whatever let's look at this biblically though it kind of feeds into that same mindset of esteeming somebody else better than ourselves, of showing hospitality in whatever situation especially to the people who are good and who are going about to do good instead of sort of ignoring them or letting them you know muddle on in their own we give them a hand try to help them out and see how we can be servants to them how we can care for their needs a couple other verses and then i'll probably be done um of course philippians 2 probably the definitive place um philippians 2 3 and 4 let nothing be done through strife for vainglory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. So, and then it's going to go on after this and talk about the act the specific way that Jesus Christ's mind of being a servant and his serving one another in love played out. Um, but for us, it's kind of like we need that mind. We have to be esteeming others better than ourselves to um, look on the things of somebody else to see what they need how can we care for them how can we look after them um, and then of course Romans 15 Romans 15 1 through 3 we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves 
Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is, as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. So, again, we see this idea of when somebody needs something, when somebody's struggling with something, an infirmity, right? When somebody has this infirmity, we are helping share the burden. It's like that mindset of Sam and I know I always use weird like fantasy or science fiction examples for movies, but it's, if, if you've seen Lord of the Rings, it's like the relationship of Sam and Frodo. Um, Frodo was the ring bearer. You know, he was the good man, but he couldn't do it on his own. He needed somebody to help care for him. And Sam, you know, Sam helped share the load. And for a time, he even did take the ring and bear the ring to help destroy it. But it wasn't his, that wasn't his job. His job was to help look after Frodo and get him all the way. Um, because Sam had the mindset of a servant for Frodo. And that's really how our mindset is supposed to be toward each other, is to be looking after each other and looking at what burdens everybody is bearing and how we can help help them out with that. Um, and in love, to serve one another in love. So anyway, just a quick thing, quick little moral of the story that I was thinking about as I read through Exodus 2. And there's a lot more there. Um, I don't know. It just seems like Jethro is a really good example, and I never noticed that before. And hopefully I get to come back to this look at it a little bit more in depth. I'd like to. Maybe when I do the written blog, I'll do that, because I get more time to look at stuff in greater detail then. But anyway, thank you for listening.